Uh, we're going to move on. We have, uh, are you all set, uh, Eric? Yes, sir. Okay. So we're very fortunate to have uh, a member of the house here with us. Uh, yeah, and uh, we all know Eric Lucero, uh, Mr. Social Media. He's all over the place, isn't he? And, uh, you know, he, he's very subtle. You know, he doesn't. He doesn't like the word he loved clothes. He's a subtle man, as you know. And um, he's low key. But we love him anyway, don't we? No. What are they? Really, what are the, what are the, one of the best political leaders I think we've had in Minnesota a long time. And uh, we always appreciate the work of uh, Representative Eric Lucero, who's going to talk about election integrity. That's why we're here tonight, folks. Election integrity. Take it away, Eric. Thank you. Well, it is always uh, an honor to come down uh, to such a great crowd, so many friendly faces. Uh, is this volume okay? Yeah. yeah. Good deal. So uh, I always appreciate uh, Rick inviting me down. Uh, we've had multiple conversations. It's, it's a battle out there. We are in a continuous battle. How many feel it? Absolutely, and that's why you're here tonight, right? Because we are deeply concerned about the future of our republic. Not only our community, our state, but our country as a whole. We see the headlines every single day, whether it be the newspaper, whether it be uh, the television cable, and much of it is just shocking at how far we continue to stray from the bedrock principles that founded this great country and how we got to where we are today. And it is under attack. And again, it's just incredibly shocking. For those who don't know who I am, I am uh, Eric Lucero. I am the state representative from Elberville, St. Michael area, uh, 30B up in Wright County. I'm presently serving in my fourth term, and it is uh, a true honor to fight for the Constitution, to fight for individual liberty, and I am not a career politician. Believe me, I am there for one reason, that's to fight for the truth. So the, to the topic, the theme tonight is election integrity. So how many remember when President Obama, then I think it was candidate Obama? Boo. Yeah, exactly. I don't remember if it was candidate or if he had been elected yet. But he made the comment, his objective is to fundamentally transform America. How many recall that statement? Yeah. Well, they have not forgotten that objective. Now, there was a pause for four years while President Trump was in office. But if you analyze that statement, fundamentally transform. Now, we know that our country, as every country in the history of humanity, is not perfect, right? We have scars on our history, and we acknowledge that. But making changes to our country is radically different than fundamentally transforming it, right? And so the objective of fundamentally transforming is because they cannot stand the core that makes this country great. What is that? The recognition that liberties flow from our creator. And that as a result of them flowing from the creator, government isn't able to take them away. The purpose of government is to protect the unalienable rights. Correct? Yes. It's a fundamental core. That's one of the things that makes us unique among all other countries in the world, is the recognition of a creator, and that's the origin of liberty and the purpose of government. Another is that, the, as I already mentioned, these rights are unalienable. These liberties, individual liberties are unalienable. And how many in here are Star Trek fans? Is anybody going to admit having been to a Star Trek convention? Like I have, I, I'll admit it, I've been to a Star Trek convention. Well, you know, I was watching Star Trek II recently. I think it's Star Trek II. Is that the one where Spock dies? I think it's the Wrath of Khan, for those of you who die hard. Uh, anyway, so Spock is, is passing away. And he makes the statement that I found truly shocking. 
that the good of the many outweigh, or what do you say, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few and even the one. And, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't think much of it. I didn't know anything about it, right? But when I hear that statement now, that is the antithesis of the value set that our Constitution seeks to, to protect. That it is an individual liberty unalienable. That it doesn't matter if there's a tyranny of the majority that seeks to impugn the liberty that an individual has, there is no justification that can take that liberty. They can confiscate or to seize it, right? So that, I was just shot. My jaw actually dropped when I heard Spock say that. What an, a complete antithesis of this country. But to fundamentally change it is what the, the Democrats are seeking to do. And one of the ways, there's many different battles that they're on, on the war path fighting. But one of those is election integrity. And we have seen that this has been going on for years now. And we need not look any further than the state of Minnesota for the shenanigans that the Democrats continue to perfect here in Minnesota and then export to other parts of the country. Right, think of the Coleman Franken race. It didn't start there, but that is a great example of ballots being found in the trunk of a vehicle, right, without, with a broken chain of custody and then being permitted to be counted. And the margin so close, that tips a race, right? But it goes on from there. These shenanigans continue to happen. So we are no longer in a voting day. We have voting season, where it's 46 days before an election. And so it's not an accident that they continue to push this, right? Whereas we, seeking to protect those unalienable rights, we understand that authentication is very important to ensuring one person, one vote, right? And we are very familiar with the concept of the authentication in our digital lives, right? You log into a banking website, you have a username and a password, right? By the way, I do cybersecurity for a living. And so we're very familiar with the principle of authentication and username and password. So what is a username? A username is claiming to be somebody. What is authentication then? It's proving you are who you claim to be. So identifying yourself is what you put in the username. You're identifying yourself. Okay, but anybody can make that claim. But now you prove you are who you claim to be through authentication. And we do that in every area of our life. You can't fly without authenticating yourself. You need to show a passport or some ID, right? You can't buy cigarettes for the most part. There are many activities. You can't go on un uh, uh, un uh, unemployment insurance or other types of government benefits without authenticating yourself. So we're very familiar. So why would the Democrats be so against Pardon me? Can't buy a gun without an ID. Yeah, exactly. Cannot exercise Second Amendment rights without an ID. But yet, there's a continual push and resistance against one having to authenticate themselves to cast a vote. Why? Because they recognize they cannot win honestly. They understand that the core of this country is for the principles and values of the Constitution and that they undermine that with multiple efforts. Okay, and there's many things happening. So we've gone to stretch, instead of voting day now, we're stretching it out. So we have voting season. And this allows for, I don't know if you're familiar, that when you cast a vote in either the primary or the general election, not who you voted for, but that you voted is public information. How many are familiar with that? Okay, only a handful. And that data is updated on a daily basis. So in these 46 days prior to an election now, it doesn't matter if you vote in person, if you vote absentee, if you vote by mail, however you're doing it, when the vote comes in and it's counted, that is reported to the Secretary of State and the Secretary of State's website then updates that they have received a ballot from you, that you have voted. Again, it's not a recognition of who you voted for, but that you voted. Why is that important? Because the other side is monitoring this and they have a system and infrastructure in place 
to continue to go after people that they have targeted as going to vote Democrat or likely to vote Democrat, and they will continue to hound them until they see that a ballot has been reported, right? It's one form, it's a mild form of voter harvesting, right? The next level of voter harvesting, which they're pushing for, is to have somebody else be able to capture that ballot for them and bring it in to the office where it has to be deposited, right? That's the next level that they're pushing for. It's incremental. And so we've seen the stretching of the voting data voter season. We see the push for having to eliminate these other safety and controls that are in place. Again, to erode one person, one vote. So now in this most recent election, one of the other philosophies of the Democrats, the radical progressive leftists, is never let a crisis go to waste, right? So when they saw, wow, here is a fantastic opportunity. We can harness the momentum of COVID and use that as a mechanism, as an excuse to advance our continued progressive cause of eroding our election protocols and, and safety mechanisms to ensure integrity, right? And so what they did, so Secretary of State Simon then comes to the legislature, by the way, the Constitution gives authority to write election law. The U.S. Constitution gives authority, plenary authority it's called, plenary authority to the state legislatures to write their election law, right? And so we, in the state of Minnesota, the legislature has written its election law with many stipulations and requirements. And one of them is that regardless of how you vote, the vote must be received no later than 8 p.m. election day. It doesn't matter if you're a uh, military voting overseas, you could be voting absentee in the state of Minnesota, however you're doing it, it has to arrive by 8 p.m. election day. Another is to have a witness signature, right? Another is you couldn't vouch for, uh, I think, more than 10 people, if I recall correctly. And I think another was you couldn't assist filling out the ballots of another, maybe somebody disabled, whatever the, the case, I think it was more than three. So there were caps. To vouch for up to 10, to assist up to three, you had to require, if you're voting absentee, to have a witness signature, ballots had to arrive at 8 p.m. election day, right, these things. So Steve Simon, he comes to the legislature, the institution that's tasked with writing election law, he does this on April 8th of 2020, right, a few weeks into COVID here, a month or so, and he makes some suggestions. He makes these very suggestions. Well, guess what? The legislature, we chose not to make, or we made a few changes, but not what he was recommending, okay? And that was within our authority to do so, per the Constitution, U.S. Constitution. So what does he do instead? Not satisfied, continuing to try to harness the crisis of COVID to advance the cause, he then, uh, they orchestrate a series of events, and there's a group out there, How, has anybody heard of Democracy Docket? Okay, a handful of people. They're tied to the De National Democrat Committee. And Minnesota was one of the battleground states. We were considered a battleground state for the election. We were one of approximately 12 identified battleground states. So this group called Democracy Docket, represented by the same lawyer, and this name might ring a bell, Mark Elias. Has anybody heard the name Mark Elias before? Yeah, exactly. He's been a, uh, a progressive Democrat lawyer for years specializing in the area of elections. Okay, so this left-wing group represented by Mark Elias, they have filed lawsuits in multiple states, and one of them is ours here in Minnesota. And in Minnesota, that lawsuit then is against Secretary of State Simon. Under normal circumstances, Secretary Simon would be expected to uh, uphold or fight to defend Minnesota election law. Instead of choosing to defend Minnesota election law, he gives in to the series of demands. And guess what those demands are? They are the proposals that he gave on April 8th that the legislature chose not to enact. And so he agrees to these demands. Again, it's a left-wing progressive group represented by a left-wing progressive lawyer filing a lawsuit against a left-wing progressive Secretary of State, and then he succumbs and gives in and agrees to the demands to change election law, and it's formalized in a document called a consent decree, 
And that consent decree is then signed off and approved by a district judge. Guess who the district judge is? Sarah Gruling, who herself was a former senior staffer for Amy Klobuchar's campaign. Okay, so I have a left-wing progressive group by left-wing progressive lawyer suing a left-wing progressive secretary of state. Then you have a consent decree signed off and agreed to by a left-wing progressive judge. Does that sound like an orchestrated series of events to usurp the constitutional authority given to the legislature and to unilaterally rewrite election law? Absolutely. That's exactly what it was. So based on that, uh, my co-plaintiff here, we filed a, a lawsuit. One of many lawsuits that were filed, and it went up to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. Are you speaking, by the way? You are speaking, right? Later, yeah. Okay, so I won't, I'll let you explain. No, I'm, I'm doing outreach. Keep going. You are, okay. So we, uh, the lawsuit, uh, how much time do I have left, by the way? I didn't start my timer. No, no, no. <laughs> you never say that to a politician. So I am both a politician and I teach the Bible. I'm not a pastor, but I'm a Bible teacher. So you're saying that you're telling me as much time as I have is dangerous. I can't. We'll risk it. How much? I can't see the clock. Is it? Fifteen more minutes. All right. So we file the lawsuit. It makes it up to the court of appeals. I can't get all the details. But they agree, so a two, a two to one decision, they agreed to allow for an injunction because we would likely win the merits of the case. And they filed an injunction that said for these ballots, one of the stipulations that was agreed to was that ballots would be allowed to be counted for a week past election. They come in, and if they didn't have a postmark, it would be presumed they were mailed on time. Okay, and so, they say we would likely prevail. So they have this, this restraining order that said that the ballots that were received by 8 p.m. have to be in one pile. All ballots that come in after that time would be in a separate pile, segregated ballots. But that would allow for a, sub, it would require a subsequent lawsuit to actually make it a ruling on the merits that those, uh, that, that election law unilateral change by the Secretary of State was illegal. Unfortunately, there just wasn't enough time as we've heard. Now, another lie that we've heard in many of these uh, courts across the country, and including the Supreme Court, how many have your left-wing friends, family members say something to the effect of, well, the courts have ruled against, you know, they've, they've upheld the, these voting laws, blah, 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 right? Some form or variation of that, right? Well, that isn't true. Nearly every single one of these lawsuits was dismissed for administrative or technical purposes, like, lack of standing, like it wasn't filed in time, these other things. I, I'm sure there are some, but if there are, there are very few that have actually been decided based on the merits of the case. And there's a big difference of dismissing a case for a technical reason versus making it a, a ruling on the merits, right? But that doesn't matter, facts and truth don't matter because that isn't how the left operates, right? So they're not gonna repeat that part, they're just gonna say the courts ruled, well they didn't rule, they dismissed on administrative purposes, right? So anyway, the Eighth Circuit rules in our favor. That's, that was a small victory. Unfortunately, there wasn't enough time to uh, have another lawsuit uh, based on the merits of the case. So unfortunately, they get away with it, right? They get away with this, this uh, attempt to give the appearance of legality. So, let me switch gears slightly. How many are familiar with the, the principle of separation of powers? Okay, nearly everybody, you should be, because we've been witnessing the usurping of the separation of powers by the executive branch for over a year now, right? Okay, how many are familiar with the principle of checks and balances? Okay, same number of hands, right? So, when, when I say checks and balances, likely I can, I can see some of the cartoon bubbles over your head. <laughs> You're thinking of the check that the executive branch has over the legislative branch to veto, right? That is a check and a balance, right? Another check might be the power of the purse the legislative branch has over the executive branch, right? Another check is the judicial branch check over the legislative branch by ruling a law or statute unconstitutional, correct? 
Okay, so we're familiar. Those, those are the most commonly taught. But how about the check of the legislature over the judicial branch? Right? That's often not spoken about. And what is that check? Whether it be the state level or the U.S. level. Money. Funding. Funding. Impeachment. Yes. Impeachment. Yes. That's the check. So when's the last time you've heard of a judge being impeached? Never. When's the last time you've heard of bills being vetoed? No. Right? It happens all the time. Right? Bills are vetoed. So the, the, the one check, the executive over the legislative, is exercised a lot. When's the last time you've heard of statutes or, or laws being struck down? All the time. Happens all the time. So the, it's, the judicial branch exercises its check and balance over the legislative branch all the time. But we, when's the last time you've heard of a judge being impeached? Yeah. Right? Hardly ever. Yeah. It does happen, but hardly ever. So what does that allow? It allows for a judicial branch to be run, to, to run well outside the lines of which they're supposed to operate, right? If there's no correction mechanism, how many in here have children? So if you did not discipline your children, would they scribble outside the lines or would they engage in activities that were well outside the purview, purview of what's acceptable? Would that happen? How long do you think it would take? <laughs> do you know friends that choose not to discipline you know, it's, it's better to say yes than no philosophy and their kids are just nightmares, right? Some people's kids, right? So that is what we're seeing happen here with the judicial branch. They're operating well outside the lines and it's not a new phenomenon. This has been going on, it's been compounding for decades because of the lack of the legislative branch to rein them in. And we have that authority to do so. These judges, the judicial branch, should be very concerned about the way that the rulings uh, impact and their interpretation. But they're not that concerned about it. They're rewriting law, they're allowing things to happen, right? They're actively reading things into the Constitution that aren't there, and they do so with full confidence because they, they are, are confident they're not gonna be held accountable, right? Okay, so one of the things that I'm seeking to do is I've already introduced articles of impeachment against that judge. Okay, how many heard about that? Thank you. So how many heard about this through the news? Right, yeah, no, I don't see a single hand, right? So I, as a member of the legislative branch, House of Representatives, I introduced this article, I can't read the whole thing, it's four pages, um, but whereas, I'll just read two parts. Whereas Judge Sarah Grueling violated the legislative authority of the Minnesota legislature, a co-equal branch of government, by failing to impartially administer justice by colluding with the Secretary of State, Steve Simon, and the democracy docket to provide the impression of legality to the consent decree issued in the Rosa B. Simon. And whereas Judge Sarah Grueling's actions violate the right of franchise of every voter in Minnesota who entrusts elected officials, including judges, to protect the principle of one citizen, one vote, violate equal protection under the laws of Minnesota, violate Article 1, Section 2 of the United States Constitution, and it goes on, right? Now, do you think the Democrats have any interest in, in bringing this up for a vote? Huh. No. no, they don't. But the fact is, I'm gonna introduce it, and I did. And I'm gonna continue this narrative because the judicial branch needs to be held accountable. Exactly. I right now in the middle of working to get the draft for Secretary of State Simon. He's, I was trying to get it done as soon as I could, but those articles are being drafted right now, and I'm fully anticipating introducing those by the end of next week. So that's, uh, yeah. Thank you. They need to know they can no longer get away with it, right? And while we know that the, the same Democrat-controlled House of Representatives that's failed to hold the executive branch accountable, Governor Walls, I know is going to not allow for these to come up for a vote, I understand that, but we need to continue to push, we need to continue to fight. We can't just say, you know what, they control, they have the majority, so we're not gonna give it an effort. So we're gonna keep pushing, get the narrative out, to get the truth out there, and this is one of the mechanisms that'll allow us to continue the dialogue from now until the next election. So there's a lot more I could say. Uh, what do I got, five minutes? So, Rick, do you want me to Q&A for two minutes or? Go ahead. Okay, all right. And if there's no Q&A, I can talk as long as I want, so. <laughs> all right. Are you gonna be able to have impeachment hearings and get evidence and use that as a forum to bring some of these things to life? 
Unfortunately, no. And the question was, will we be able to have an impeachment hearings and bring more evidence, get it into the, the media and mainstream in the conversation? No, because I'm in the minority as a Republican, Democrats control the majority. All impeachment proceedings must start in the House, and therefore there isn't an opportunity to start them in the Senate until and on if they pass in the Senate or in the House. And so, yeah, the Democrat majority is not going to allow for here. They're going to not let these see the light of day. Republicans won the election in 22. Could you still do it? Back to. Um, yep. That's a good question. Uh, I probably. I guess I don't know if there's a statute of limitations on articles of impeachment. So, right. I mean, the Democrats they continue to you know they, they continue their manufactured uh, articles there. So no, I, I I don't know the definite answer, but I would suspect that the answer is there's not. Uh, so if we do have the majority, you're saying after the next election, could we bring these back? Um, I, I would hope so. I would, I'm certainly going to try, uh, but I don't. I don't know for sure. Yes. Are we doing anything to recruit an opponent for that judge? Do, uh, sorry, is it, do Are we, we doing anything to recruit an opponent to challenge that judge? Uh, if we are, I am not. Uh, I've got my hands full in the minority uh, in the House. Every conversation that's taking place, by the way, so just to throw this out there. So I sit on, I sit on three committees. I sit on the Congress. So the question was, are we doing anything to recruit the judge? Because judges are up for election. And yes, we absolutely should be doing that. So that is something that we need to start. I, I am not. But here's what's going on in the House. I'm, I'm a member of three committees. The Congress Committee, the Capital Investment Committee, and the Public Safety Committee. And there are other committees that I'm not a member of, like the K-12 Education Committee, like the uh, Commerce Committee, I mean the Transportation Committee, like the Agriculture Committee, like the Higher Education Committee, and there's more. It doesn't matter what committee that a bill is being heard in, or a presentation is being given in. It's happened in the three that I'm a member of, and I've heard from my legislative colleagues, it's happening in every committee. Every disparity that exists in Minnesota if a disparity exists, I'll put it that way. If a disparity exists between uh, certain population groups, that the disparity is the result of racism. So in the Capital Investment Committee, they wanna, they wanna build a, a, a tunnel over I-94 through St. Paul, the Rondo neighborhood, something like that. Uh, and I actually heard somebody say that because uh, minority groups are, have less vehicles per household than other demographic groups do, that they are, that is a, a result of racism. Because minority groups are more likely to live closer to freeways than non-minority groups, they, for, they therefore are subject to less clean air, and therefore there are more health complications. And that, so that disparity of the health complications that results from living closer to proximity to freeways and all the, the fumes that come out of that is race. I actually heard somebody say that. Okay, in the Capital Investment Committee, I heard somebody say, because we were talking about housing, right? There's a lot of housing uh, crunch right now. If you're, if you're a seller, uh, good for you because there's no better time to sell a house than right now. Uh, by the way, I'm a real estate agent, so if you need help, I can help you. So uh, if you're selling a house, um, that was part of the conversation anyway, not selling house, the, the whole housing crisis and uh, renting and the shortage and stuff like that. So in the Capital Investment Committee, uh, one of the representatives from the Rosemont Apple Valley area said, with all of the developments that are occurring, we have homeowners associations, right? And if not homeowners associations, many of the ordinances, the zoning ordinances, um, if you're familiar with zoning ordinances, it controls what you can and cannot do in your property, like have an RV, have uh, certain you know types of, of use of your property, and one of them is chicken coops. Most residential neighborhoods, if you're in a homeowners association, prohibit chickens, right? Most do. Some might, but most prohibit that. And even if you're not in a homeowners association, most local residential ordinances would prohibit a chicken coop in your backyard, right? Well, representative said the fact because chickens are a predominant diet of some minority ethnic groups, and because cities uh, and HOAs are prohibiting chickens, that is the direct result of racism. 
So again, it doesn't matter what committee it is, it's just, it's unbelievable. So here it is, that's the signal to wrap it up. I hope I won the Texas Wait, please.